All right. Hey, good morning. It's uh, man, we got a brand new week coming our way. So I uh, hope you're ready for it. Hope things are good in your world and, and you're excited about it. We have, uh, I think, on record today our uh, hottest week of the year so far. And uh, I, it, we're not in the double digits like you guys in Arizona yet, but we have that humidity to deal with that, that you don't. But still, hot is hot, right? And so uh, we're just preparing for that and getting ready. Uh, just looking at things around the world and and uh, surveying all of that, man. We're praying for Hawaii and the troubles that's going on in in that realm and and um, down in uh, Florida and the coast down there. They got some things going on. California has some things going on with the uh, Hillary and and all of that. And so uh, a lot of a lot of things to to pray about. Check on people, friends around the world. And so uh, hope you're doing well. Uh, looking forward to the day that God's given to us, and I'm ready to crack open the Word of God and really dive into some truth. And um, I had someone say the other day, man, I love how you say dive into truth. Uh, but I don't know where that phrase came from. I've been saying it my whole life, though. I just I want to dive into truth. Uh, I do. I think that's where we should swim. I think it's important. I think that we can't downplay that. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that go out. Oh, you know, theology is not important or what, you know, doctrine isn't important. It's love that's important. But really, without a good understanding of doctrine, your love kind of has uh, no place to kind of land the plane, so to speak. And so it's important that we study God's Word. And that's why we do what we do here at the Daily Notes. That's why we work uh, verse by verse through some uh, books of the Bible. And uh, my goal is to finish the New Testament. Uh, and Lord gives me that opportunity. I'll do that within a few years. Uh, we're close now. I mean, really, we're finishing up Luke, and then we have First and Second Corinthians, Hebrews, Jude, Revelation, and Matthew. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll just plod through and just enjoy looking at the scriptures together. And uh, I'll have a record of uh, of my studies through the scriptures to refer back to. So. I don't know why I'm saying all that. Let's jump into some truth, right? We're in Luke chapter 6. We have flipped the page. Man, we're flying through the book. And uh, and so we've seen that, that Luke has one purpose, and that is to show that Jesus is Messiah. That's what he's doing. And so he is explaining to the friend in whom he wrote this letter that he had done great research, that he had looked at eyewitnesses, that he had studied the other Gospels and compared to his own understanding of things Moved by the Holy Spirit, he began to pen the words of this gospel. And so uh, he started out by showing eyewitness accounts of Jesus before he was born, looking at John the Baptist and his mom and dad and Jesus and his uh, mother and, and, then, and Joseph, and then all of the other uh, the eyewitness accounts and the, the angelic and Simeon and Anna and all of those that demonstrated that this is the Messiah. Then he begins to show how he is dominant over everything that the first Adam failed at. And so we've seen that. We saw that that uh, <clears throat> he had he had authority over the temptation of Satan. Jesus did. Uh, Adam failed there, right? So he has power over Satan. He has power over sickness. He has authority over demons. He has authority over leprosy. He has authority over paralysis. He has He has and is willing to hang out with the dregs of society, like the tax collectors and all of that. And so we've seen that. Now we move into this concept of the law, and he has authority over the rabbinic traditions. That's what we should call it. These, these aren't laws from the scriptures. He's not violating the law of the scripture. He's superseding what the rabbis had done to the law by adding so much to it and making it uh, a form of spirituality of how well you can maintain those laws. So if we look at, and so today he's going to talk about, uh, he's Lord of the Sabbath. And so let's just look at what that says. I want to, before we jump into six, you don't need to go anywhere, but I'm going to read to you Exodus 20 so that you will know really the entire scope of the Sabbath. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, Exodus 20 verse 9. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's a rest day. On it you shall not do any work. You are your son or your daughter, your male slave, your female slave, your cattle, or, your, or the resident who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. For that reason the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. The whole point. What's the whole point? 
just to give you rest. That's the point. It, it, it wasn't it wasn't to offer sacrifice to God. That's what the Pharisees had turned it into. It wasn't, oh, look at us, we're sacrificing to God. No, it was, hey, we're going to enjoy a rest because a merciful, compassionate God has said, this is good for you. And so this is what it is. This has nothing to do with, uh, you know, with, with sacrificing to God and paying homage and, and worship. It's, it's a reliance on who God is to give us rest. And so that's what was going on. And so uh, <clears throat> when we get to the story in Luke chapter 6, it says, now it happened. That, again, that's one of those things. He's not necessarily saying these are all in sequential order. He's just running. There are times, and you'll see it, where he's moving from scene to scene, and they are a continuous chronological thing. And then he will make statements like, now it happened. That just means that I, I just want to tell you a story. It could be sequential, but it's not necessarily so. And so he's just saying, hey, here's a story for you. <clears throat> and so it says this, and let's read it. It says, now it happened that Jesus was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath. Now, that was a usual thing that would take place because uh, the roads sometimes were uh, really between fields. And so, and we have that down South Alabama. You can see a lot of that. We just, we've cut roads and you see uh, cotton fields and, and uh, peanuts and, and uh, corn and everything down the highways down there. And so you're just cutting through fields, and some of the some of the people own property on both sides. But before these roads were in there, you would walk and you would go between one wheat field going to another place. And so this is what was happening. It was a normal deal. You would you would see people. Uh, in fact, when Jesus tells a story of the uh, parable of the of the, of, of the uh, sower, that some of that seed that fell on the path. That's what he's saying is that sower would be sowing seed in his field. He may walk from that field to this field, and there's a path. <clears throat> and on that path, some of, the, some of the seed would lay. And so that was what was going on. So just get the idea of it's kind of a dirt road. You know, if you have those dirt roads where you live, it's just kind of one of those dirt roads. It's a shortcut. They're just taking, they're taking a walk. It's the Sabbath. And it says Jesus was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the head of a grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating them. Now, that's a common practice. If I were to take you, <coughs> and I will, uh, back to Deuteronomy, it'll say this. When you enter your neighbor's standing grain, which is what they're doing, they're entering that field to pass through on their way to another, and the grain is standing, right? You may pluck the heads of grain with your hand, but you are not to use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. You're not going to grab that sickle and start cutting your neighbor's field. Now, it's not because that violates the Sabbath. This has nothing to do with the Sabbath. It has to do with you don't steal from your neighbor. But you can pick. It's okay, and your neighbor should be okay because we love our neighbors ourselves. If if I'm walking by a tree, and there, there's, you know, it's a fruit tree, and it's hanging over a fence, and I want to grab a, a piece of it, they're saying, hey, that's okay. You can grab a piece of fruit. What you can't do is get your basket, get your ladder out, and start harvesting that, that tree. The same thing here. Hey, you can grab that grain while you walk by, but you can't take that sickle down, throw some stalk in your in your uh, ox cart, and, and head on out of there. This is the whole point. But, but the Pharisees can't seem to see all of this. And so it says, uh, and the disciples are rubbing the grain with their hands. But some of the Pharisees says, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, <laughs> You, hear, you get these Pharisees, they're just like little uh, you know, Barney Fifes trying to make citizens arrest. They're just chasing them, him everywhere to catch him doing something wrong. And so they say, why are you doing what is, un, what is not lawful? Now, it violated no command in the scriptures. What it did violate was what they had in the Talmud, which they had taken uh, over time. They had taken the law, and they had improved it, if you will. And so... Uh, if you were to read the Talmud, there would be 39 categories filled with do's and don'ts over and above what the scriptures speak of. And so when they see, when you and I see Jesus passing by and his friend, we just see him grabbing some grain, kind of rubbing it between their fingers and popping it out. Maybe kind of like we do sunflower seeds, right? Kind of, you know, you kind of break it. Pistachios are the same way, right? You just kind of do that and then you get on your way. You're removing the husk and you're going to eat the food. Well, they didn't see it that way. They saw it 
as a violation of the Sabbath. They saw it as you were reaping on the Sabbath, right? Because you plucked it. You were threshing because you were kind of tossing up that kernel stuff. You were sifting and separating the grain from everything else. You were grinding it between your fingers, winnowing, preparing food. You were cooking. This, this is what they see. They see like eight violations of a law. Jesus sees the mercy of, of a God in heaven who just says, Hey, man, you, you can eat because I own everything anyway. And so that field is, in a sense, your field you're going to honor that man. You're you're going to you're not going to steal from him. But it's good that we share as neighbors. And so this is this is their culture. This is the contrast. This is the thing that we're seeing. And so some of the Pharisees said, "Why are you doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath?" Jesus answered them, saying, "You guys not read what David did now." He knew, obviously, he knew they did. They had memorized most of the scriptures. They knew the stories. They have debated and rethought and retaught and tweaked and everything down through the ages, everything in the in 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 the Old Testament. And so he says, Have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? And he said to those who were with him. Now that, that means he's looking now at his disciples. It could have been more than, than the twelve. Could have been a crowd, could have been some of the women, could, right? You know, he has that entourage that kind of follows him. So when it says disciples, we don't necessarily just think it was the 12. Could have been more. Could have been a lot of those who had been following him from one place to the other. And so he says to the Pharisees, I mean, you had not read David? And then he turns away from them because he, he's in con, non-concerned about them. They're, they're hardened hearts. He's making sure his people understand truth. And so then it says... He turned, it says, uh, and Jesus answering him said, Have you not even read what David did when he was hungry and he, those who were with him? How he had entered the house and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any, anyone to eat except the priest alone, and gave it to his companions. Now, so what he's saying is, hey, there was a story in the Old Testament. David, David ate the showbread. David, David ate the bread out of the tabernacle, which you're not supposed to have. But he did. He said, because, and, and he even gave it to his companions. Now, let's read that story so you can see it in the big picture. It's just six verses, so we'll grab it. It's in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. It says this, Then David came to Nob. Now, he's running. He's on the run from Saul. He's king. Everybody knows it. Samuel has made that plain, but he's running. So he comes to Nob, which is, um, which is on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and it's where the tabernacle really is at that time. And so it says, Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? He's concerned because he sees the king and, and, and he's like, man, what's going on? So he's the priest is concerned. You see this compassion on his face. And he's like, well, why are you alone and why is no one with you? The king has commissioned me with the matter and has said to me, no one is to know anything about the matter on which I am sending you and which I, I place uh, your commission. And I have directed the young men to a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? He's like, hey man, I've got a, I'm have got. i on a secret mission. i got some people stashed out, and here's what I need. <clears throat> he says, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread and whatever can be found. The priest answered and said, there's no ordinary bread on hand. Now, so every week you would lay 12 loaves of bread on the show table, the table of his presence, right? Two rows, six loaves here, six loaves here. And then at the end of that, you would take it off, and the priest could eat that, right? That that kind of fed his family. But it, every every Sabbath, I mean, every week, week, every week, it would be placed on there. Then it says, <clears throat> "There is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is the consecrated bread. If only the young men have kept themselves from women. Now, if they're clean, they've not violated any laws." David answered the priest and said to him, "Be assured, women have been denied to us as previously when I left." The bodies of the young men were consecrated, though it was an ordinary journey. How much more then will their bodies be consecrated today? Right? Hey, they're they're consecrated. They're, they're set apart. There's we we're all law abiding, holy people here. So the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there except the bread of the presence, which was removed from its place before the Lord, in order to put hot bread in its place on the day it was taken away. Now that's the story that now Jesus is telling, and he's and he's explaining that story to them. <clears throat> and so he says, um, 
verse 3 and 4, <clears throat> how he entered the house of God and took it, ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest, and gave it to the, his companions. And he was saying to them, this is an in their face, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now they knew that he had been calling himself the Son of Man. That's a term from Daniel, which refers to the Messiah. He's been calling himself the Son of Man. Others have called him the Son of Man. And he says the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Basically, that was an in-your-face, back up, and try again. Because you're wrong. I can show you where I've not violated Scripture. David didn't violate Scripture. And so that's where he slams him. Listen, the point of the law is compassion and kindness is more important than sacrifice and ceremony, right? That's why he, he gives them opportunity to get their their neighbor's ox out of the ditch. He said, we're not going to consider that working. If that neighbor, his his wagon with his ox, gets off in that ditch, and then the, the Sabbath shows up because the sun falls, you're not going to go, well, i got to wait for 24 hours. I know, I know your animal's laying on his side, and it's probably going to die. No, you can get that ox out of the ditch. You can let him get home. He can't, you know, and this is what's, this is what's at stake here. So it, it's meant for mercy. That's, it, it's the, the Sabbath is for mercy, not for sacrifice. And they had turned it into this ritual. Jesus is turning everything up on its end with them. And so he's saying, hey, son of man, Lord of the Sabbath, I inter- interpret the law. I am the law. And he says, and I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Remember when the scripture says that? <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's step one. <clears> that <throat> Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, on another Sabbath, so Luke's telling the stories back to back. That was one. He's just walking through the fields. They accost him. He tells a story and then looks at him and says, look, I, I am the law. I, I am the law. And, and I say it's mercy triumphs sacrifice. Now, second one. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. So, here it is. Again, is it law or mercy, right? It, which is it? Is it this sacrifice or mercy? It's a Sabbath. He's breaking no law written between the sacred text between Genesis to uh, Malachi. Not one law is he breaking here. He is taking their little uh, extra book of, of Talmud and laws that they added to improve the text. And he's saying that's sheer foolishness. And so, just so we're clear, this is what's going on. Now, so he, he's, he's teaching, right, because that's what he's doing. He's one of those passing uh, rabbis. He would teach in the synagogue. He's there, and there's a man there with whose right hand is withered, right? Something wrong with it, shriveled up. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath, so they might find a reason to accuse him. Can you see the blind, utter, blind uh, idiocy of them? They're, they're more concerned of these, you know, violated rule, you know, than they are that he's showing mercy to a man whose hand is withered. They have no mercy. They have no compassion. These are evil people seduced by Satan. And so it says here, but he knew what they were thinking. Man, never try to play chess with Jesus uh, because he always knows your next move. But he knew what they were thinking. And he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he got up and came forward. Jesus said to them. Now, here, here's the man standing there. Jesus is, is, is sitting. He stands up because uh, uh, because he te- you teach sitting down. So so he's got this man standing there, and his hand's all with him. Potentially, Jesus is still seated, could be standing. And he, he, he's looking at this man's hand. Then he looks at the crowd. And he says, um, and he got, he got up and came forward, verse 9. And Jesus said to them, I ask you whether it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do harm, to save life, or destroy it. Can, <clears throat> it. Which is lawful to do good or, or to do harm? Which, which which is which is better? Is it better to save a life or, or to destroy? The life? Is it better to just let something die instead of doing being merciful? What what's going on here? He's asking: Is it law or mercy? Which is more important? Is it your silly rules or being merciful? What is it that God requires? What does the Lord require of thee? Now they they knew Micah six eight to do justice to love mercy. To walk humbly before God. They were doing none of those. And so here's what Jesus does. <clears throat> and after looking around at them all, he said to him, Hey, son, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. 
but they themselves were filled with senseless rage. Here, Isaiah had been chastising the people. If you read Isaiah, you would see where he chastised them for their ritual Sabbaths. And he says, away with this. You, that stuff makes me sick. Yet the Pharisees are still trying to prove their worth before God by all of their rules. <clears throat> and, uh, and so it's that the Sabbath was made for, for God to give mercy and they had turned it into sacrifice. And so they're enraged and began discussing together what they might do with Jesus. Man, crazy stuff, right? Well, bless you. Be merciful today. I'll see you soon.